Welcome to the next installment of my video lecture series for international economics. And in this particular video lecture, I'm going to be taking a look at something that appears in Chapter 2 of your textbook, and it's the gravity model. And in particular, I want you to be aware of the origins. And its origins, actually, were the reason why it's called the gravity models. Its origins lie in Newton's law of universal gravitation. And in that, we have that the force of attraction between two bodies, I and J. And let's assume that I is equal to the Earth and J is the Moon. is equal to a gravitational constant. And it is equal to the mass of the Earth multiplied by the mass of the Moon divided by the square of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So this is what basically what it's saying is that the force of attraction between two objects is related to the mass of the two items, but inversely related to the distance of the two objects that we're talking about. So more massive objects attract each other more, but if the distance between those two grows, that force of attraction decreases. This was adapted by Jan Tinbergen, who uses basically the same exact form and to model international trade. I believe this comes from roughly 1962. And also realize it's been adapted to a whole range of different interactions between countries, migration, tourism, foreign direct investment, etc. So this functional form has been used and adapted to model numerous types of interactions that occur across international boundaries. And the gravity model of international trade, as you can see, looks very similar. So we have T sub IJ. So this is the level of trade between country I and J. Realize that this could be done two different ways. This could be the flow of trade from country I to country J. So for example, if we were to assume that the United States is I and Canada is J, you could use this to model the amount of trade from the United States to Canada. So you could think of it as a one-way flow of trade, or alternately, it could be used to model the flow of trade in both directions, i.e. the flow of trade from the U.S. to Canada, and then the flow of trade to the, uh, from Canada to the United States. So it could, be, it could model both of those simultaneously. So the level of trade between two countries is equal to a constant, and it is directly proportional to the level of GDP and country I, in our example that I just gave in the United States, and the level of GDP and country J, which is Canada. But it is inversely related to the distance between the two countries. So what this is basically saying, just like the gravity model, larger countries in terms of GDP are more likely to engage in trade with one another. But that level of trade decreases the further the distance between the two countries. Now, if you take a look at this, you'll see we have, uh, you know, the uh, GDP of country I to the power of A and the GDP of country J to the power of B and the distance to the power of C. Please note that for most research that is done, these A, B, and C end up being estimated at roughly equal to one. A and B are found most of the time to be between 0.7 and 1.1, I believe. And C generally is always estimated to be roughly around 1. So realize that we can get rid of these. If we assume that A, B, and C are equal to 1, we get to the form uh, that is in the textbook. Realize that these are the same. Uh, they're just written a little bit differently. I wanted to make sure that this was written in the same form that appeared in the textbook. So trade is directly proportional to a constant, the GDP of both countries, and inversely related to the distance between those two countries. So as the GDP of countries increases, the level of trade should increase. But as the distance between countries increases, the level of trade between the two should decrease. So why is distance so important? Make sure you realize that distance 
can act as a very good proxy for transportation costs. Realize that we're just talking about trade coming from the United States to another country or two countries. We don't know exactly how far each of those transactions actually took place. So we don't know that something originated in New Jersey and went to the Netherlands and versus something that originated in Kansas City and ended up in the Netherlands. So we use the distance between the two countries as a proxy for the distance, uh, as the distance. And we also recognize that this gives us a good indication of relatively what the transportation cost between the two countries could be. Also realize that distance indicates that there's a time in shipment and then the longer the shipment time is, the greater the risk of that transaction. For example, that shipment could be damaged or lost in transit. So for example, you could have something on a ship and it sinks and disappears. Or they could go through a storm and a portion of the things that you're shipping to from the United States to the Netherlands or from the Netherlands to the United States get damaged in transit. So there's a risk involved and in the, the longer the distance, the greater the risk of shipping. Also, if you're sending items that are perishable goods, this leads to a higher risk of decomposition and spoilage. So if you're shipping perishable items from the Netherlands to the United States, the longer it takes, the more likely that it's going to decompose or spoil in transit. Therefore, there's going to be a higher level of risk. And finally, realize that distance impedes communication. And some people refer to this as transaction costs. Now, you will realize that with changes in communication technology, face-to-face -face trans, uh, transactions don't occur as frequently, but there are still some industries where face-to-face -face transactions are very, very important. So that's an important thing to realize that even though we have you know, email and video conferencing, the fact that you some transactions, it's still important to meet with somebody face to face in the process uh, leads to the fact that the further away you are increases those type of transportation costs. Also, uh, I forgot for the second bullet point that what occurs is that you during the these longer distances, the market can change during transit. So if it takes three months for something to get from point A to point B, that market may longer exist or the market might have changed completely. So by the time that you ship those products to a particular market, the price that you expected to receive might be completely different than the actual price. Also, the distance, make sure you realize, too, that there are could be cultural differences. Generally, the further countries are away from one another, they vary drastically culturally. If you ever get to travel overseas or to go another, to another country, particularly if you go to Europe or go to China or India, the, the cultures are very different and the way transactions occur are very different. So the distance could also be an indicator of any cultural differences that might actually exist, that might impede tra uh, trade between two countries that are further and further away from one another. Also realize that, that this gravity model in itself is not perfect, that there are certain augmentations or changes that individuals make in order to try and improve the model. What I oftentimes refer to this is that that particular gravity model is a, a recipe, but the recipe can be adapted uh, to account for other things. For example, Per capita income is oftentimes used instead of GDP, just taking GDP and divided by the population. The rationale for this is that in general, the higher the level of per GDP, per capita GDP, the higher the level of trade. Also, wealthier countries have a tendency to have better infrastructure, better roads, better airport facilities, better portage facilities, etc. So that would indicate lower transaction costs for international trade. Also, the fact it's referred to here as adjacency, but the fact that you're right next to another country. 
All right, the fact that the United States shares a border with Canada, the United States shares a border with Mexico, that's an important component that is oftentimes included in models uh, using the gravity model and an addition to an augmentation to the gravity model. Also, the fact that there can be language issues and slash colonial links. For example, what I like to talk about with this one, the colonial links, that in the United States, even after the Revolutionary War, all right, we fought to gain independence from Great Britain. After the Revolutionary War, we still engaged in trade with Great Britain. Even though we had fought a war with them, there were the colonial links and there were pre-existing trade that was going on, and we shared a common language with them. So it made it easier to engage in trade than it would be to develop those trade routes with other individuals. And also border effects. There are still border effects, even though... There's free trade is getting easier and easier. I shouldn't say easier and easier, but trade is freeing up and there are fewer restrictions for international trade. The impact of crossing a border still is there. For example, you can look at items that get shipped within Canada. Let's say a thousand miles in Canada versus a thousand miles into the United States and across the border, that, that type of trade will less likely to occur, even though the distance is exactly the same because the border still physically exists and there still might be impediments that occur because of that border. For the language part and the border effects, I oftentimes like to bring up Belgium, the country of Belgium, as an example. If you take a look at Belgium, you will see that it is surrounded by three very large economies. France, the Netherlands, and Germany. It is also shares a border with Luxembourg, but Luxembourg is a very small country, but it has a very high per capita income. So it would be important probably to include that if you were doing per capita income, the fact that it borders Luxembourg. So it has some very large economies that it borders, and it if you take a look at Belgium, I believe that 90% of its GDP is exported to other countries. So it has the border effect that occurs because it borders, uh, I mean the adjacency effect, because it has, it shares borders with uh, those large economies. And because of the European Union, the, the border effects that used to exist crossing in other borders don't occur anymore. Additionally, Belgium shares languages with the Netherlands, France, and a portion of Germany. Uh, Belgium, the Flemish part of the country, they speak Flemish, which is a dialect of Dutch. Uh, if, if, there, uh, if you know any Flemish speakers, they will probably vehemently deny that it is a uh, dialect of Dutch, but they are very similar. For example, if you learn to speak Dutch, you will be understood in the Flemish-speaking part of uh, Belgium. But realize because they share that border, they and they share the border, and they share a language, it's going to facilitate trade between them. There's a portion of Belgium that speaks French, or the Walloonie section, or Wallonia. They speak Wallonie, uh, which some people to be considered a dialect of French. If you speak French, you'll, you'll be pretty well understood in Wallonia and uh, Wallonia in in Belgium. So they share a language, so it'd be easy to engage in trade with them. Also, one of the things that helps to explain why Belgium has such a high inter level of international trade is it has the second largest port. In Europe. Antwerp is a large port facility and it gives them the advantage in shipping things over the ocean. They have a, it's an excellent portage facility. I've been to Antwerp on a number of occasions in my life and it's a huge, impressive port. It gives them the advantage in transportation costs. So just make sure you realize that not only do we have the gravity model, but the little tweaks that can be made to improve the predictive capabilities of the gravity model.